Good afternoon. My name is uh, Moritz Wilder von Balmuth. I'm a cardiac surgeon here at Houston Methodist and a co-director of Reevolution Summit. And on behalf of the entire team that really makes that wonderful um, educational experience possible, I would like to welcome all of you to Houston. And I hope you had a, a fruitful and interesting morning so far. Um, I would like to uh, thank all the faculty that's come from really across the United States to make this possible, which is, I think, a very unique hands-on educational experience. And I would like to ask all the Twitterati's out there, and I know we have a few of them, to um, lobby for the summit. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for everyone that's here. Uh, it gives me great pleasure now to uh, introduce our lunch speaker, which is um, Eric Skipper, who is, if I'm informed correctly, the uh, adult uh, director, medical director of adult cardiac surgery at Singer Heart and Vascular Institute. Uh, he has tremendous experience in minimal invasive uh, cardiac surgery of all kinds. And last year, he gave a wonderful lecture on cannulation strategy, something that is uh, maybe not as often talked about as necessary. It's common to all the procedures we do um, in adult cardiac surgery and certainly common uh, to all the minimal invasive uh, approaches we take and really some important nuances that he uh, points out in this talk. So I'm very excited to hear it again. Um, this year, it was a fantastic talk. So with further ado, thank you so much, Dr. Skipper. would like to welcome you up. Good afternoon. I don't want to interrupt everybody's lunch, so uh, keep eating. Uh, it's been a great morning. Tremendous faculty. Um, I think this is a phenomenal meeting that uh, the onus is on all of us that are here to go back and tell our friends about it. Uh, of all the meetings that I attend, this is one of the most unique meetings. And you always walk away with, uh, you know, I say if you leave a meeting without two pearls, you haven't been listening. I think this meeting you leave with about 10 or 12 pearls, and that's if you're half listening. So I think all in all, it's a great meeting, and, uh, uh, and it's an honor to be asked to participate. So uh, I really have no disclosures pertinent to this discussion. Uh, I do some consulting and receive research grants and support from some industry sponsors, but uh, nothing that really relates to this discussion. I thought it, it's important to step back as cardiac surgeons and, and kind of reassess what we do. And in this talk, I want to talk about uh, image-guided catheter placement relative to cardiac surgery. Uh, it's changed a lot during my practice, and I'm sure it will continue to change a lot during the practice of everyone out there, no matter how old you are. Um, cannulation considerations relative to minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Um, lessons learned from uh, our neighbor's toolkit, to borrow one of Dr. Lumsden's uh, favorite uh, terms that he likes to use. And then my favorite is the KISS principle, which has served me well for the last uh, several years of practice, which is keep it simple for me or the surgeon or whatever word you want to put in there. When we attend the summit, uh, we hear themes repeatedly, but they're very important themes. And I think these are the themes that are the keys to our success. And it's probably the reason that those of us who have been in practice are in this room because we have adhered to these things. Uh, we continue to learn and evolve. Dr. Ramchandani uh, alluded to that this morning. We innovate through collaboration. That's what this meeting is all about. And we uh, should always repeatedly explore our neighbor's toolbox. It's amazing what I learn when I go hang out with the orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeons, the general surgeons. They have really cool toys. And oftentimes those toys have applications in my field. When we talk about percutaneous catheter and line placement, uh, this starts at the beginning of the case, oftentimes before the surgeon enters the room, but it's extremely important. Um, over the last 20 years, we've evolved from uh, just placing lines via landmarks to hopefully placing lines with ultrasound guidance. Uh, I recently had a, a partner who was walking down the hall in a very frustrated a morning he had a nice complex case planned uh, that he had just canceled because his uh, swan sheath ended up in a carotid artery before he got in the room. Uh, so little things can make a big difference in our days and also in the patient's day. Um, 
Ultrasound uh, guided placement is something that has gotten a lot of attention and I pulled this article from the Journal of Critical Care from 2017 that looks at a structured review and recommendations for clinical practice. And you know, a lot of what we do, if we do it the same way and we do it with the same considerations each time, it works out better. And they recommended a six step systematic approach. The first step with three components is to assess the target. You must know the anatomy. You need to localize the target and make sure it's patent. It's amazing how those things can vary from uh, week to week, day to day. The IJ that was patent two weeks ago may not be patent now because the cardiologist paid it a visit in the interim. And then real-time ultrasound guidance for puncture to confirm the three components of needle is actually in the target, the wire is going where you think it's supposed to go, and that the catheter is being positioned appropriately in the vessel. And these seem like very basic things, but they're true tenets of being successful in what we do. There have been a myriad of studies published over the last 15 years. Uh, a lot of these uh, studies and uh, uh, societal guidelines have, have told us repeatedly that we should use ultrasound guidance for deep line placement. In spite of this, there's still this gap that exists between knowing we should and actually doing it. Um, hopefully, in most of our institutions, we use ultrasound a lot, but we know that it's not exactly used 100% of the time. It's pretty simple, it's not hard. As a surgeon, I can do it, so pretty much anybody can do it. Uh, my uh, nurses and the uh, cath lab techs, depending on what case I'm doing, uh, usually get there it is out before I recognize what I'm looking at, so it shows you that it's, the knowledge base isn't very detailed. But you can get a transverse or a longitudinal view. And if we uh, think about it, this really tells us where we want to place our catheters. Anatomy is extremely variable. Those of us that are involved in any sort of uh, uh, CT imagery or uh, angiography type study understand that anatomic variations are there all the time and you don't necessarily know where you're sticking things if you're doing it purely based on landmark guidance. Uh, this is actually a, a picture from that article that I told you about from Critical Care and it does a really good job of showing alignment of the probe placement of the needle and the probes have made it very simple. There's an arrow now on the probes that say, oh, here's where your needle's gonna be in the center of the probe. And both a transverse and a longitudinal view. The technology's gotten more user friendly over the last 20 years and really and truly, it's so readily available, we should use it. There have been a number of studies that have shown us that it actually works. It's of huge importance in assessing patients with uh, atherosclerosis. It oftentimes helps you avoid placing catheters and lines in the middle of a plaque, but rather you can place it above or below that safely. It's an adjunct in the obese patient, which is a huge problem in North Carolina. I know it's not a problem at all in Texas or any other state, but in North Carolina it's a big problem. Um, altered anatomy, anatomic variation is huge. Um, low systemic perfusion pressure, you can't always fill the pulse. Uh, but it's amazing uh, when you can see it on ultrasound, it makes it a lot easier and the lines get placed more accurately and more quickly. non pulsatile flow, um, oftentimes we're ending up doing things on patients that uh, nowadays may have mechanical support devices that have continuous flow. And these patients have all typically had multiple prior cannulation attempts. They've had procedures and things may not be patent today that were patent a couple of weeks ago. Um, looking at the studies published uh, compared with palpation, numerous studies have shown improved success of cannulation, reduced time of cannulation, and re reduced line-related infections. Compared with fluoro guidance, it's also shown improved cannulation rates, improved first pass success, uh, reduced number of attempts, reduced time, and reduced vascular complications. So the evidence-based data is there. On the venous side, again, you hit it if you can see it. So improved cannulation, uh, no longer is it the start here, stick until you get in it type approach. Um, 
improve first pass attempts, reduce number of attempts, reduce time, uh, reduce risk of complications, the list goes on. Uh, and at the point of my partner's case, avoidance of unintended arterial puncture. It's in some studies been shown to be of greatest importance in the obese patient and the uncooperative patient. Um, it's also been shown to be important in mechanically ventilated patients for IJ support. Um, confirms vessel location and patency, approves success, and reduces your mechanical and infectious complications. So how does this relate to what we do once we come in the room as surgeons? Well, we need to look at these other people's toolboxes, toolkits, and learn from them. So when we talk about cannulation for adult cardiac surgery, minimally invasive, uh, we can talk about conventional versus alternative, central versus remote, arterial, venous, venting, cardioplegia, the list goes on. But just organizing it in some sort of thought process helps go through it and understand things better. This is what most of us who are, who've been in practice for 10 plus years, uh, we're used to seeing in the operating room, is some sort of central cannulation strategy. And this slide, uh, which I borrowed, shows uh, very nicely bicable cannulation. Um, I think here, bicable for the students in the room, bicable cannulation, a retrograde uh, cardioplegia catheter, anagrade cardioplegia catheter, and vent, and an aortic cannula shown here. So conventional standard central cannulation. But what about with all these other incisions? So people have spent time upstairs today looking at alternative access. Um, how do the mentors and the leaders in the room uh, achieve what they're able to achieve through these small incisions? Well, from a cannulation point of view, it's what's accessible and what fits through the hole. So a mini upper sternotomy gives you different access than a mini lower sternotomy with a J or a T. Um, is it a man's cab or a, min or a man's type uh, mini operation? I, I joke with one of my uh, younger partners and accuse him of not doing a minimally invasive cardiac surgery cabbage uh, and I emphasize, it is one of my younger partners. You'll see one of my contemporaries here tomorrow. It's not him. But, but in reality, is it a man's cab? Is it a, is it a maximal access non-sternotomy incision that you can drive a truck through? Or is it tr a true minimally invasive incision? Because they're very different. Or is it totally endoscopic? Because things are totally different. Uh, uh, Dr. Guy back there uh, can um, get a lot of things through a little 12 millimeter port. So it's pretty impressive. So with direct cannulation, you're putting something big in the aorta. What tricks can we use to make it easy? Well, we want ease of access. We want, if it's out of reach, where our fingers aren't gonna reach it easily through a small hole, you wanna have a facility with a knot pusher. You wanna preserve the aortic adventitia so that it helps with hemostasis once you're done, and reinforce the purse string uh, with a second adventitial stitch after the cannula is out uh, if you think there's any risk of bleeding. Second most common is femoral arterial cannulation, and most people, I would say, today do it through an open technique. Uh, 20 years ago, we would get circumferential control of the vessel, be it artery or vein, and we would create a lot of issues that left us with tremendous lymphocele and healing issues. We try to avoid those today. So we really just expose the anterior surface of the vessel, uh, make sure we're on the common femoral artery, put in an ovoid purse string, more like a transverse American football type picture, Seldinger type cannulation, uh, confirming that our guide wire is in the descending thoracic aorta using our friend, the transesophageal echo and our anesthesiologist's hands and then do atraumatic dilatations to not disturb the intima or not elevate any plaques unnecessarily. Um, we want to insert the cannula so that the tip is either in the proximal iliac or distal, um, ascent, uh, distal uh, abdominal aorta. This lessens the likelihood of it being in a high pressure zone, getting up against a plaque, and creating the ever dreaded retrograde dissection. Dr. Lamellis uh, published a really nice review of uh, over 2,000 cases in 2017. 
And these were consecutive patients. It was a retrospective analysis. And uh, he looked at uh, what happened with his femoral cannulation platform. For those of you who know Dr. Lamellis, know that he does not routinely image patients. He does not routinely use uh, intraoperative ultrasound. So this is luck of the draw. But it shows us that it is actually a pretty safe procedure, at least in his hands. In 2,645 patients, he had 58, uh, or 58 had prior strokes, 422 had had previous heart surgery, and 276 had a history of peripheral arterial disease. So 2,400 of those were femorally cannulated versus 244 centrally cannulated. His stroke rate was amazingly low in that patient population at 1.17%, 31 strokes, no dissections. He did have two patients with compartment syndromes and two patients with femoral artery pseudoaneurysms. Biggest problem was seromas, and these were typically open femoral access, 174 seromas for 6.65%, and a low 30-day mortality in this patient population of 2%. So his conclusion was that overall, femoral cannulation for minimally invasive cardiac surgery is a low, has a, risk of, a low risk of complications. What about percutaneous cannulation? We do it for ECMO. We do it for transcatheter aortic valves. We, we, we stick things through the skin, into the arteries, and they're big all the time. Um, ultrasound guidance is a big adjunct for this, um, plus or minus fluoro. Um, I think ultrasound is far more helpful in most of these cases than pure fluoro. Seldinger technique to confirm wires in a descending thoracic aorta, as we've discussed with TEE, and consider percutaneous closure devices. You want to use a stiff or a stufer stiff wire so that there's not buckling in the subcutaneous tunnel, and you want to make sure that you atraumatically enter the vessel, and that's where watching it under ultrasound uh, guidance can be helpful to know that things are going in smoothly. And this helps to avoid that dreaded entomal injury or distal flap. Again, you want to insert it fully and avoid retrograde dissection. As fate would have it, there's a really nice review uh, from 2017 uh, published in uh, the uh, inter, uh, inter interventional or interactive, I'm sorry, interactive cardiovascular and thoracic surgery, where they looked at 445 patients that were um, percutaneously cannulated with arterial closure devices. So just out of curiosity, how many people with their minimally invasive platform do arterial closure devices? So a few, but it's certainly not the majority. This was an interesting paper. It, it did have the fault of being retrospective and non-randomized, but it was over a consecutive period of time. And they looked at um, conventional surgical approach to groin cannulation versus percutaneous using arterial closure devices. Um, most of them were arterial closure device cases. Uh, their pre-op assessment was limited. It included a history, palpation, and auscultation. Um, if they had a history of peripheral arterial disease, femoral surgery, or iliofemoral PCI, they were excluded. And um, they did no pre-op groin imaging at all. So they were brave. Their technique was to use ProGlide Perclose system, uh, where they uh, percutaneously accessed the artery and the vein initially. Then they would use... Um, a guide wire technique, Seldinger technique, to place two proglides. Uh, they then followed that with a 16 French dilator prior to placing a 20 French arterial cannula. Venous cannulation followed that. They were very regimented in their approach. The decision on whether or not to do open versus uh, percutaneous was left up to the surgeon. Post bypass, they took the venous cannula out first, reinfused their blood from the pump, and then removed the arterial line and secured their proglide knots. They did do a pressure dressing for about four to six hours afterwards. This just uh, is a nice illustration of the proglides going in at uh, 10 and two angulation. Um, it's interesting, a lot of people are looking at single proglides instead of dual proglides. Um, 
Uh, I think in the blind setting of a non-hybrid OR, two makes a little more sense. In this particular paper, the um, operative risks were actually higher in the arterial closure device patients going in, 10.6% versus 7.9% uh, Euro scores. Their bypass times were amazingly close at around 132 minutes when you dissect the paper. But their total OR time differed by about 21 minutes, and that's where the savings came to place, came to be with the per-closed devices. Overall complications on the left is all cases. 8.7% um, in the cut down versus 2.3 in the percutaneous. And to show that there really wasn't a steep learning curve, they put their first 100 cases up, and you'll notice that they, their arterial closure device complications were zero in that group. So they felt that this showed that it wasn't a terribly steep learning curve. You have to love these slides. Uh, this is an open incision versus percutaneous, and everybody loves this. Looks almost as good as Dr. Guy's uh, robotic mitral cases. So groin cannulation for cardiopulmonary bypass was felt to reduce complications, reduce OR time, reduce hospital stay. They did show a slightly reduced hospital stay of about one day, and thus most probably offset any increased cost from the per-closed devices uh, when one values OR time and a shorter length of stay. We can't, we can't forget our other Alternative cannulation sites for arterial cannulation. This shows an axillary artery cannulation through a side graft. Um, you can also certainly cannulate it directly, but I would say most people put a side graft on. Open technique, muscle sparing, direct cannulation uh, if the vessel's big, but typically it's not that big. Uh, people are starting to consider percutaneous options. Um, it, they're certainly done for transcatheter valves with an axillary approach and pre-closed devices. And I think as we become more facile with things and also uh, fluoro and angiographic availability are available to assess things afterwards, it makes a lot of sense. Cross clamp options uh, that go along with cannulation depends on what sort of cannulation you use, but uh, I would say a lot of people use standard cross clamp, be it with a flexible cross clamp or with a chitwood clamp. Um, they both work. Um, you can use an endo clamp. Uh, I think most robotic platforms would, would favor this. The uh, endo aortic balloon has gotten markedly better over the last two plus decades uh, when one compares the balloon catheter of 1993, 495 to that of today, I don't think there's much of a comparison. This is a picture from about 2.5 decades ago uh, that shows the, the, li the lineup for a standard endoaortic uh, uh, type aortic cannulation or um, clamping. But you can't always get there from below, so you have to have other options. There are, uh, for the total endoscopic robotic options, there can be endodirect, where you go in and you place a similar cannula directly in the aorta, pass a balloon through that. You can give plege and occlude the aorta as well. This is an artist's rendition of what the endodirect uh, situation looks like. And this would give you an artist's rendition of it coming through the chest wall out of the field of the operating port. This is a direct view or camera view of things. Uh, again, looking at what direct looks like. Venous access uh, typically uh, is with a 23 or a 25 French cannula. You want to be able to have a good transesophageal echo bicaval view. Um, if you're doing conventional groin cannulation, then you're gonna do it with an open technique. Percutaneous technique uh, works very well. You wanna make sure you have a stiff guide wire, either a stiff or a super stiff with a long J tip. You get that guide wire up into the uh, superior vena cava if possible. Use serial dilators and 
the venous cannula goes in nicely. Um, there's some tricks to getting the cannula to, to lay posteriorly and go preferentially up the uh, SVC. And so you want that tip position typically about two centimeters up into the SVC, making sure that if you're doing a mitral and you're lifting up to expose your uh, mitral valve, that you're not gonna pull it out of the SVC when you put in your retractor. Typically, you can control this with a U-stitch and a light pressure at the groin once you're finished. This is, uh, just shows a picture of a uh, standard cannula. Uh, the important thing I want to show here is that once all the basket of holes have been engaged into the vein, you want to pull this inner dilator back to where the tip of the arrow is at the blue hub or at the hub. That gets the sharp tip out and allows that blunt tip of the cannula to flop back posteriorly on your guide wire and it will almost guide itself directly up into the SVC when you do that. If you leave that uh, introducer out, then you have a sharp tip, you're more apt to create perforation and it will also tend to just follow the wire and end up in your atrial appendage instead of posteriorly uh, headed up the SVC. Venting, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but you can vent either through a PA vent placed through the IJ uh, by anesthesia. You definitely want them to use ultrasound guidance to make sure they don't shove it in the carotid artery. Um, but you can also vent uh, centrally with either the superior pulmonary vein or a left atrial vent placed at the time of surgery. If you're doing a uh, mini aortic valve or a mini mitral, you can vent the ascending aorta uh, by using a, a long, uh, I, it's a DLP cannula is what I use, but a long cannula in the ascending aorta and then connect a Y connector to it so that you can give plege, but then you can also vent through it. Uh, you can do it with an angiocath if you want to set up the same situation. Uh, for a mini AVR, I place it, take it out, and then put it back in for venting once I'm through with the AVR. If I'm doing a mini mitral, I put it in and leave it in and don't worry about it because it's typically out of my way. Uh, retrograde cannulation, uh, you can have your anesthesiologist place a remote retrograde cannula in or you can uh, place it yourself at the time of surgery depending on your exposure. Transesophageal guidance by anesthesia can be very helpful if you're placing it yourself. Um, Again, we covered this with the venting. This is the endoplege catheter. Again, this is more of an anesthesiologist skill set, and if you use it, it's important to use it often so that they're not slowing your case down. So what do I do? Um, I typically do a non-sternotomy, non-robotic type approach for my, my minimally invasive operations. I do believe in imaging patients ahead of time, so I will get a CTA of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. I think it helps me pick out patients that I want to avoid retrograde femoral arterial perfusion from. It's amazing what you find if you look. It also tells me if the femoral vessels are going to be favorable or if there's any high bifurcations or things I need to be made aware of. Um, I use primarily an open technique, but have been more and more intrigued of a percutaneous technique with uh, um, arterial closure devices. If I'm not making a groin incision, but I need a venous cannula down there, then I will do that percutaneously 100% of the time. Um, I prefer venting via the left superior pulmonary vein if I'm doing an ascending aorta, uh, but I will do a PA, a PA and an aortic root vent if I'm doing a mitral. I use modified del nido cardioplegia because I like to avoid having to redose every 15 to 20 minutes, and I found that to be uh, great. I've been using it since 2010. And I tend to put on Q pumps and do intercostal nerve blocks and all these people to keep them happy. So I got reminded I had five minutes. I think I'm going to finish a minute early. Uh, so minimally invasive cardiac surgery, as everybody in this room knows and has seen today, is actually a team sport. Um, it requires a lot of help to do it and do it well. The strategy that you use should always fit the patient and you should always tailor that strategy to the patient. You need to always have a plan B and develop a comfort level with all strategies. Can't say collaborate enough. 
and I can't encourage you to look at your neighbor's, neighbor's toolkit enough. And with that, I'll stop and answer any questions. Thank you.